JP and Rue to the Rue Swanzor here again on your breezes. Take a big dog-worthy sniffle. By order of you-know-who, in highest doggerland, the mild and incomparable wild E, inimitable face dog, the dog in the moon, doggissimo in perpetua, the great high and humble dogger. If you have the new Dog Solutions hardware for whatever device you're using to listen to this podcast you know already from the olfactory enhancement, make sure to turn it up if you have a cold, that today we have some cold chicken in the studio, there's some laundry on the floor that needs doing, and that I had light roasted coffee earlier today along with several walnuts. Feel free to equalize and tune those scents to the relative strengths you prefer. If you haven't hooked up your Dog Solutions apparatus yet, or heaven forbid, haven't bounced over to dogsolutions.dog to tender your digits and get the show on the road, so to speak, I suppose you'll just have to imagine the scent of mazy snowflakes melting into the deep brown fur of Rue de la Rue Swanzor's back. I'm going to just go ahead right now and talk for a second about the Dog Solutions device. In anticipation of your breathless interest, it has tons of amazing features, this thing. And I'm not going to go into all of them. It's a real breakthrough technology, and I'm proud to be the first podcaster, the first any caster, to get to try it out. So what it is, is microphone for smells. You switch it on, it's just this little device that looks like a jet engine, very sleek and modern and cool. And you switch it on, and it inhales for a few seconds. You can hear it circulating the air through its sensors as it creates the fundamentals of a scent picture, which it then converts via proprietary patent-pending dog solutions algorithms into zeros and ones after it manages that bit of digital alchemy. And by the way, the sampling rate is astronomical on the basic model and gets almost comically astronomical -er if you spend a few extra dollars. Whatever stink it might be, I can send it all over the world to anybody who has the printer. Now, of course, what I'm calling a printer is, since it reproduces smells, obviously not actually a printer, though it does work a little like your Ruth Bader Ginsburg, okay, RGB, Ruth Ginsburg Bader printer, where red, green, blue, and black make whatever color you want. That is earthy, floral, oceanic, and so on, blended with utmost precision. Make just about any fragrance. Don't ask me what the smell analog of black is. And don't say poop. So anyway, order it at dogsolutions.dog. It's the whiff. Get a whiff. Send a whiffer. Woof. Dogsolutions.dog. Just a hundred bucks. Use key code doggerland at purchase. Woof. Whiff. A roo. And in case you forgot, Dog Solutions will work with you. To create a one-of-a-kind, bespoke dog just for you. Don't settle for a dog that'll do. Get started on your just-right dog today from Dog Solutions. So people, and I use the term loosely, so as to include within its scope pretty much all the bipedal apes that ever swaggered across a step, huddled on a promontory, or rocked themselves to sleep in the fog-bound heights of a rainforest spectral canopy. People hear that listless trumpet sounding. Ba, 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 da, 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 that clear, solo, heedless voice in their heads, their strolling egos telling them tunefully, in a manner of speaking, telling them of their own peculiar and rare worth and worthiness, tilting ever toward the tonic of their unequivocal superiority. Says who? Says Rue de la Rue Swanzor. To put it another way, says Rue, maybe in Darwinian terms, human arrogance is at once the most galling and the most adaptive characteristic of your species and its antecedents. Even the stupidest among you are convinced they're brilliant. 
we've persuaded ourselves, that is, the dogs have encouraged us to follow our anyway insuperable inclinations and convince ourselves that we're at the tip-top of the tower as far as animal intelligence goes. It's what we've believed ever since we had the cognitive wherewithal to consider the question, but, of course, not quite enough of said wherewithal to capably check our work. And upon this false conclusion, we've piled crazy edifices of thought, including the Rousseau's laughable idea that people domesticated dogs, perhaps, as some say, about 30,000 years ago, or, as some others suggest, much longer ago than that. Fetch, says Rue de la Rue Swanzor, is a game dogs invented to entertain monkeys before there was a land bridge between North and South America. Now, I don't want to get bogged down in all of what we think is probably true, paleontologically speaking, about the appearance of monkeys in South America or about how dogs, the earliest ancestral dogs from the three trunks of the Kennedy tree, might have gotten to Europe and Africa and back again, or how they came to the warm Atlantic shores of what we now call Brazil. At some point, I assume, will happen upon the evidence that what Rue de la Rue Swanzor has communicated to me is true and veritable. I don't doubt a word of it. I trust her implicitly to tell me the T-R-O-O-T-H truth. A big enough pack of dogs is a persuasive force as far as a few apes are concerned, if the apes have been caught out in the open, particularly unarmed apes. The chase's hunting strategies refined ceaselessly for practically forever by the time of the earliest simians, wherever and whenever you want to put them, two million years ago, let's say, in sunny Brazil, or if you prefer the marshy Black Sea coast of what we'd call Bulgaria today, in a forest of grand oaks, and beaches, somewhere along the Velika River, maybe within earshot of some chattering Mandarin ducks. Some two dozen hunters of the chase encircle a pair of people. I call them people, early people, for convenience sake. Why not? And they're out gathering nuts, maybe, in a meadow, buzzing with insect energy, ablaze with yellow and violet and periwinkle flowers, a break in the trees in their deep shadows, the duo pause. Remark the sweetness of the place, note the matted grass where deer have lately rested, probably deer, and find themselves at the center of an overwhelming number of dogs. Scary probably, right? Sure. But there's no menace in this pack. They're friendly. One of them, not the biggest one or the most ferocious looking one, but rather the handsomest, the one with the most winsome doggy smile approaches slowly, leans languidly against the legs of one of them, pushes the side of his head against her hip as if to say, pet me, we want to be your friends, everything is cool. To the people, it's sort of a miracle. To the dogs, it's just the first step in the implementation of a plan that was carefully thought through and pre-tested, stage by stage, by a coterie of dogs assigned by the chase to... A panoply of long-range efforts intended to assure dogs of their primacy and influence throughout the existence of life on Earth. So she pets him, names him with some nonsense word which he takes care to remember, and more dogs come close without threatening, with frankly affectionate manner, all practiced carefully, and others begin to play games of race and wrestle, splashing in the river, shaking off too close for courtesy, bowing and rearing. And those two people are overcome with the sheer riotous joy of it all, and they join in. It turned out to be easier than any of the dogs expected. There were pushovers, Rue says. They never really had a chance, those people. And the more they played with those dogs in that riparian paradise, the more they were rewarded. On the first day... They left with several geese, already plucked. The chase dogs had trapped. The day after that, they found a tall pile of walnuts, and so on. Fish, partridges, apples, rabbits, 
all the delicacies the land and river and sea provided, and all manner of useful things. In short, those two were trained to visit that spot every day by being rewarded for faithfully returning every day. Just exactly the way we train dogs to come when we call them. If we have any skill as trainers, fetch. Fetch was simple once they'd been trained to show up. A dog would simply drop a pear, a nut, or something, making sure the person saw, then reward the person with some bright feathers or maybe a whole bird as soon as he or she brought the item back. Because dogs can't throw, sometimes the trainer dog dropped something buoyant in the current of the river, barked to show concern about the object floating away, and then again rewarded the person for re- returning it. Fetch. Easy. Rue says just about everything is fetch, or a variation on fetch when it comes down to it. It's something we haven't been able to agree on. I thought at first she must be joking till she started ticking off examples in an obnoxious barking voice, which is the tone she uses when she thinks I'm not paying close enough attention or I'm being disingenuous or my stupid brain is failing both of us on purpose to frustrate her, which is common enough. Tying your shoes? Fetch with string. Making hamburgers? Fetch with beef. Writing an email? Fetch with words. Shoveling the sidewalk? Planting a garden? Doing the dishes? Fetch with snow? Fetch with seeds and dirt? Fetch with crockery? Bark, 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 bark like it's the most obvious and common sense concept ever imagined by thinking creatures. The energy of the scold. In your incompetent head, she says, pointing at my head with a fluffy jab. There are a dozen people wiping their feet in the breezeway, hanging up their coats, checking their watches, making endless small talk. Let them come inside. Which is a pretty mean thing for your dog to say to you. So, but... Fetcher, no. What eventually happened after the pair by the river finally got trained is the chase would bring them into the wider pack of the chase, introduce them to the several hundred dogs or more of the community, sort of as pets, for more refinement. And at this point, they were more or less permanently removed from whatever relationships they had with other people, their original clans, if you will. Rue de la Rue Swanzor wants me to be sure to say that in almost every case the chase's human adoptees were happy to be part of the chase and only rarely, if ever, expressed any wish to rejoin their human families. She says she knows, the chase knows, there will be those among you who consider these separations to have been cruel. Here's what Rue de la Rue Swanzor said about that. Tell them I scoff at their ignorant milk toast, knee-jerk, thin-slicing, addle-pated sympathy for those helpless dopes. Then she sat up and said, Tell them, without the chase, you all would still be comically stalking grebes through cattails and settling for fungi and voles, if your species still existed at all, or if it even ever did exist. Rue de la Rue Swanzor cannot be bothered by wishy-washy sentimentality. For one thing... She has far too much yawning and sleeping to do. But I have also been taking a great many calls for her over the last few weeks, sorting through sacks of mail that are getting heavier every day. We've had to create a space for the business of the chase here in my house, and for several mornings now I've been opening the door to a pair of business-like hard-nosed pointers who barely pause for a perfunctory hello before hurrying upstairs to the office and getting right down to whatever is on their agenda. And I don't mind, really. But I feel as though it's fair for me to mention that the great project's inner workings, as manifested by these bird dogs, are unclear to me, even though I spend a fair amount of time and money making sure the workers and Rue de la Rue Swanzor are well supplied with tea and ink, toast and butter, along with a fair quantity of cheese from Normandy and elsewhere, which, thank goodness... I am somehow able to have shipped at a steep discount from an online source I am not at liberty to name, and which arrives via bicycle courier twice a week. The delivery person is an extremely pleasant, 
and plainly dog beloved woman from Cameroon who addresses Rue and the others in French, a language I comprehend only when spoken lentement, as they say, and even then, incompletely. So she talks to me mainly in English, what little we have to say to each other, and sometimes in majuscule French, if you will, the French of shop windows and theater marquees. She says, Voilà encore le fromage! And, Aujourd'hui j'ai plusieurs choses pour les chiens! Then she goes through the shows one by one as she takes the boxes from her panniers. Du canard, she says. Quelque poisson. Like I said, though, she's very sweet, and Rue de la Rue Swanzor speaks highly of her. Umil is her name. And her family, who have, to quote Rue again, had significant connection to the, to the chase in exile for an extraordinarily long time. When I ask how long, Rue stares at me for an eternity. She knew the last great high and humble dogger, whom you called Wiley, and several before him. Umil's great-great-grandmother lived with us in Rue Swanzo when it was just a dirt path. She sighs and jumps from the couch. She was resting her head on my thigh, but she pads over to the other side of an armchair out of view, and lies down on her side, as if to say, well, you probably know what she means by that. Umil is beautiful, I have to say. She's taller than me by maybe a couple of inches, and moves with such grace and fluency it leaves me dumbstruck. When she looks at me, catches my eyes with hers, and speaks to me whatever she says, I feel as if I've been ensorcelled by some kind of irresistibly mighty being. When she rides away, her bike seems to move without any effort on her part, as if it's simply falling down the road impelled by horizontal gravity as she yells her goodbyes in a voice that makes every word sound like music. Au revoir, rue de la rue, au revoir tous les bons chiens. If I look away while she's leaving and just listen, it sounds like She's calling from everywhere all at once. Au revoir, JP! Wherever she goes, that's where I want to go. Rue usually lets me share her camembert freely. More rarely, she allows me a thin slice of roquefort, which she says she's not supposed to eat at all. I never order it. It isn't on the list. But she can't help it. Powerless is what I am, she says, when I ask her about roquefort. If she were the kind of dog who covers her head with her paws in shame, she would surely do it in reference to the addictive hold of that potent blue cheese. She's going to be really angry at me for being totally honest about this. She'll call it an egregious and unnecessary and unforgivable violation of her privacy. She'll say that my forthrightness could result in every kind of calamity, from spiritual to emotional, and everything above and below, that it'll probably result in incursions from all sides against her autonomy and mine. But I have to tell you, Umil brings just one small round of that Roquefort for Rue de la Rue Swanzor about every fortnight, and always admonishes her. You have to make it last, she says. So Rue puts it on the shelf with its cover open and inhales like she's a bloodhound trying to catch a scent. And once, on Valentine's Day, when she thought I was asleep, I found her lying near it, her nose in the paper, softly howling to it a song of cheesy, unrequited love in ancient doggish, its words unintelligible to me, and most dogs, its emotion, absolutely unmistakable. Maybe when I record these from now on, I should do it with a big Roquefort cheese in the room, and that dog solutions whiff and coat are on, so you can enjoy Rue's favorite smell while you listen. Sniff along with Rue. I just might have to make that a regular feature. There's... Uh, there's nothing more of substance from uh, any of the engineers who've been writing to us about the great project, neither Hawkehurst or the fellow who first wrote to us, except a friendly note 
from the former to say hello, acknowledge our correspondence, and wish us well. On the other hand, we received this chilly missive from a person who calls himself a little too grandly, Rue and I agree, Octopus. He says, Hey, Rue de la Rudel, Queen of the Noodle and JP, you'll never guess who this is. The Great Project is a great big joke, and it'll never happen because it's impossible. Octopus underlines impossible three times. Doggerland is too heavy to move. Even if you could move it, you'll never get the people to let it happen. And even if you somehow talk them into it, I'll make sure you fail no matter what. Then he signs it Octopus with this big messy flourish like somebody who just started practicing Chinese graffiti and has been drinking a lot of plum wine. So we'll just see about all that. I suppose, but Octopus sounds to me like a sixth grade brat, the way he writes, and certainly not something we need to take seriously as we continue to pursue the great project by order of the great high and humble dogger. Next episode will be number 14, and it will mark the beginning of season two of the history tales, myths, and legends of the dogs of the chase in Doggerland and of the chase in exile. Thus, this episode. I'm wrapping up right now is the last episode of season one, number 13. Thanks for listening. Be sure you pop a little something into the toast and tea kitty to help keep the cheeses coming. Contribute to the great project on Patreon, Facebook, Twitter, Instadog, Rootube, Dogadoodledoo, and make sure you tell all your doggy friends about me and Rue de la Rue Swans, or we need all your help and we appreciate it. Find us everywhere. Podcasts. Our cast, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, etc. And remember, puppies the way. <laughs>